would like to welcome everyone here this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, I have to believe uh, that tonight is going to be a huge blessing uh, for all of us. This is a unique opportunity uh, for us to share. Um, for some of us, it's a, it's a topic that uh, is it's, it's a discussion that we need to have more often. I'll put it that way. A discussion about race in the church, a discussion about community, a discussion about how we as, as a church and a community can uh, be part of the solution. Uh, thinking of my father's words, and he said you can either be part of the solution or part of the problem. And so tonight we are blessed to be here together uh, with these two gentlemen that I'm sorry I'm standing in front of, but I will get down in just a minute and let you see them. Um, as we begin, I just want you to, once I say their names, just put your hands together for these two men, Mark White and John DeBerry, please. <laughs> would like to read their bios and then have a, a prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get into our program tonight. And I do want to welcome those that are online because we are, we're streaming this also this evening. Mark White was born in Union City, Tennessee, son of a minister. Mark spent most of his childhood living in Naples, Florida. In 1966, the year I was born, by the way, his family moved back to Memphis, where Mark continued to reside. reside. He is a graduate of Harding Academy and University of Memphis with a BS in education. Uh, in 2018, Mark earned a master's degree in conflict management. I've heard that that helps well in politics from Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. Mark recently was appointed as director uh, of the Lipscomb University College of Leadership and Public Service. Mark and his wife, Kathy, who's here with us tonight, so good to have you, uh, have been married 42 years, and they're from Memphis. In January of 2010, Mark was elected to serve in the Tennessee House of Representatives, where he still serves, as well as being chair of the House Education Committee. Before serving as a state representative, Mark served as a teacher, then became the principal of Harding Academy in Memphis. Also owning a local rental business there as well. Many of us know Mark from his work in Panama, the Global Children's Education Fund. Is that correct? All right, got that one right. As well as many trips uh, that many of you have taken with him uh, to be a part of the local work there. And that is Mark White. John DeBerry. John was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and I found out today that his father was born in Senatobia, Mississippi. Uh, he graduated from both the University of Memphis and Freed Hardeman University. He was instrumental in planting the Boulevard Church of Christ in 1971 in Memphis and served as a Tennessee state representative from 94 through 2020. On November 30th of 2020, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee announced that DeBerry would serve as a special advisor in his administration. He works as an executive dealing with marketing, advertising, and public relations, and now preaches for churches in Memphis, uh, Tennessee. Again, let's welcome Mark and John tonight. I do want to start off with a prayer, and there's a book that I've been reading. Uh, a friend of mine has written, his name is Avery Stafford, matter of fact, back in 1997, he spoke at our youth rally here, uh, for those that remember Avery, and he's, his book is called When uh, Collaboration Mirrors the Trinity, and he's talking about churches that get along and collaborate, and why do they do that? If it mirrors the work of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is kind of the direction he's coming from, but let's, let's bow and pray, and I want to use this prayer that he prays. Heavenly Father, the world that you created is wonderful. We're thankful that we can be part of it. We confess we've not valued others as we should, especially those who are different from ourselves. We ask for your forgiveness and that we could see others as you see them. We also ask for unity in your church. Jesus, you are the head of the church, and we want to be one body. The truth, though, is that sometimes we're jealous or prideful. 
We want to stand under your authority and accept how you wonderfully and intentionally created each one of us. So thank you for your salvation and grace, even when we fail. We love you and look forward to the day when we will all worship you together before your throne. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. What we're going to do as we begin here, we will have a moment tonight where you can ask questions if you like. So if there's something you want to ask, if you're like me, sometimes I have to write that thing down. So if during part of the session you do have a question, and uh, if you remember it well, don't be like me. But if you're like me and you need to write that thing down, put it on your phone, whatever, uh, just to help jog your memory later, there will be a question and answer moment. But we'd like to start off tonight, and I'm going to start with John and then go to Mark. Uh, We want each gentleman here tonight just to tell their story about where they're from and what it was like growing up uh, in the Mid-South here, Uh, and and maybe in some ways how that deals with the subject of, of racial tensions or reconciliation as they talk about it tonight. So, John, could you share your story with us this evening? Well, I'm John DeBerry, and I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, um, quite a while back in 1951 there in Memphis at John Gaston Hospital, which I believe it was called at the time, in the middle of a time when I I believe that uh, the country uh, was, the the country was most certainly segregated at that time, and, uh, but Memphis was a unique city in, in that you still, even in the midst of that, might have a neighbor next door uh, who was white or black and because of the way some of the neighborhoods were and a lot of times we didn't really 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 understand what was going on outside of our neighborhoods but uh, being born at a time when I was born I got an opportunity to see a lot of things and to see the changes that happen in our nation and not just see them but then understand why those changes occurred. And those changes occurred basically because of men and women like my father and my mother and others around the nation who basically understood something that I have heard my entire life. And that is that we are more alike or more similar than we are different. Uh, I, I grew up with my father working with people um, uh, and going to the church, he preached for 60 years. Uh, if, uh, you know, in the days of segregation, if Brother Good Pastor or Brother ba- Baxter, Barrett Baxter, I believe his name was, was somewhere in the area, Brother Keeble or any of the uh, those names that all of us know, uh, my dad would go. And, and even if the churches were considered a white church or a black church, uh, if he went to one, I remember going to Getwell there in Memphis when one of the preachers were there. My dad's question is, is simply, where do we sit? Not can we come in or are we welcome? It was the church. He he acted as though it was the church, and he made uh, everyone else assume that he was going to be there because he was a Christian and expected everybody else to act like Christians. In 1963, My dad was one of the individuals who was in that mass of people that were in Washington when Dr. King made his famous speech. Uh, The family raised money. He was the representative for the family. And uh, I remember watching on the small screen TV, watching that speech that Dr. King made at that time uh, with my brothers and sisters and squinting to see if we saw our dad in that millions of uh, people that were out there in that crowd. Of course, we didn't, but we knew he was there. There was something that Dr. King said that I heard resonated in my house, uh, in my home, between my parents, on a constant and consistent basis. When Dr. King made the I Have a Dream and, and the various phrases he made about his dreams, but the one that I heard the most in our home was, I have a dream that one day that my children would be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. Well, my dad didn't, didn't concentrate on the color of our skin, but he concentrated on our character. And he constantly did things, and 
he would give us work and says it builds character. When he, when he was transferred to Alamo, Tennessee, Crockett County, Tennessee from Memphis, we left a church that was almost 600 people, and we went to a little small church in Crockett County, Alamo, where there were about 35 people, where I learned where I had to grow up pretty fast. And, you know, being a city slicker, I, I threw the commercial appeal and the press seminar and the tri-state tri defender. I had a pretty good newspaper business. But now uh, I had to learn some other skills being in the country. Well, the little church uh, where we were, uh, where, I mean, they immediately hired my daddy. He had a college degree and he had six kids. Uh, he became the church. And so they made him the preacher. Uh, uh, on first sight. Well, they planted about four acres of cotton every year, and that's the way they paid the church bills. And so we are introduced as city kids uh, to the cotton field. Well, I'd never chop cotton. I'd never pick cotton. My mama just got us a copy of Cotton Picking for Dummies and taught us, uh, told us that we were, going to, we were going to do it. My dad said it builds character. And then he, he went and he rented uh, some landmark, and he planted uh, two acres of squash and two acres of okra. Who plants two acres of okra? And, and because we had, to, we had to pick the stuff every day, but he says it builds, it builds character. So this is something I heard on a consistent basis. In 1968, my dad said, well, it's time for us to integrate the schools. We were in Crockett County. We went to a very good school, all-black school called Central High School. Wonderful teachers, wonderful administrators, a great school. But because of the area and the time in our history, uh, that school did not offer some of the things that my dad thought that we would need so that we would be competitive in the world that was to come. And we constantly heard about the future and being ready for the future, being able to talk to people, being able to relate to people. Uh, this was a constant thing in our house. So my dad announced, we're going to integrate the schools, 1968. We're going to that white school. Um, my, my five brothers and sisters are looking at me, the eldest, saying, you know, talk to the man. And uh, uh, I said, Daddy, uh, what do we do when we go to that school? He called me Nick. He said, Nick, you go to school. Um, you know, we're at the table the next night. Daddy, what do we do when we go to that school? He said, Nick, you go to school. And this went on for several nights till he eventually he got a little bit upset with me. He dropped his chicken leg and his fork. He looked me head dead in the eye. He said, Nick, you go to school. You don't scratch your head when it ain't itching. You don't grin when it ain't funny. He said, you be a man. You give respect, you'll get respect. That was our whole orientation for school integration. And we went to the school, Alamo High School, Crockett County High School. It was one of the best experiences of my life because not only had we been taught to act like Christians, a lot of the kids at that school have been taught to act as Christians. And because of this, we get along. It's been 50 years. And a lot of those guys still come to, to Nashville, visit my office, uh, and we'll talk about old times and lie about how good we were playing football and stuff like that. And uh, it's because there was something instilled in my home. First of all, my father did not instill within us and would not allow inferiority to be instilled in us. I'm, I'm hard to impress. Mark White is one of my best friends, and he's one of my best friends because he's one of the hardest working people that I know. He's one of the people that I have seen stand up when others were sitting down, speak out when others were quiet, fight when others were capitulating and compromising. I'm impressed by him because of who he is, because of how he conducts himself, because of where he stands, what he stands for. That is the way my father raised us. Uh, when, when voting time came around, um, I remember my dad had a sign on one side of our yard for the black guy who was the first to run for mayor of Memphis. His name was A.W. Willis. And on the other side was a sign for Howard Baker, the Republican, who was a senator. He and Howard Baker talked. He was, uh, helped run his campaign. He impressed that it's about the person. It's not about the party, that it's about the person, what they stand for. 
and my great-grandparents were Eisenhower uh, Republicans. My grandparents were Eisenhower Republicans. My mom and dad were the first to vote Democrat for Kennedy, and it was a big rift uh, in our family at that particular time. So I'm, I know I'm taking up too much time, but I want to say this before I hand the mic uh, uh, to Mark, and that is that we, when we realize, when each of us realize that we're created by God, uh, and that he has an expectation of us. So when I went to Nashville in 1995, my district that elected me 13 times, they knew where I stood on abortion. They knew where I stood on the institution of marriage. They knew where I stood on education. They knew where I stood on government and entitlements and all the stuff that we disagree on between Republicans and Democrats. But my 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 district was drawn Democrat. In spite of my conservative ideas and ideals, they elected me 13 times. And each time, over 60%, the majority of the time, over 70%. Uh, I, at some point in time, the prevailing party that, that basically owned my district because of the way it is drawn decided that I did not represent them anymore and they decided to vote me out saying that I was not, um, I was not a Democrat. So just, just happened to be the Democratic Party, that I was not a Democrat. Um, and I, I, I knew this the minute I pushed the green button on the heartbeat bill, the minute I stood up and voted that children ought to have good schools and whatever it takes, be it education scholarships or whatever, that they should have better schools. I understood that. And because of this, um, then I was, I was put out of the party. But the thing is, there are a lot of people, black and white, Democrat and Republican, who are fair-minded and who understand that Dr. King said something before he died. He said, we will live together as brothers or we'll die together as fools. And there are a lot of folks who have made the decision that no matter what, that they're going to stand against those things uh, that pull this country together in the first place. But that's who I am. That's why I am. Um, I'm, I'm a Christian. And because I am a Christian, um, the color of the skin is the least important thing to me. Well, I told John that I just want to come down tonight and listen to him. He's got su such such a such a wonderful background. We've known each other for since the '90s, I would say. We, we got to know, and then the privilege of getting to serve with John when he was a member of the General Assembly. I'm still there. I've been there 14 years. Was elected in 2010. I think it's about the last time I came down here. We got busy up there. We I'd come down here for Panama a lot. We'll talk about that. But uh, serve, getting to serve with John, the legislator, he was on the education committee with me together, and just the amazing things. I was telling Mike and Amy when we were at uh, dinner a few minutes back is that you ought to have been on the House floor when John was serving. And we would get into really tough debates, you know, you know, political or not, or you can imagine. And so I know you probably read a lot this last year about how, how we kind of got in a lot of trouble and everything. Uh, at least the main street press said that. But when John would stand, after we all said our little thing and everything, John would stand up on the House floor and he would put a nail in the coffin. You did not speak after John. Because whether you agree with him or not, it was just you were wasting your time because everything had, that could be said was said on that particular issue. So I really miss him on the fl on the floor because we're still going through a lot of debates. But he now is the Governor Lee's chief policy person, so he's still there at the Capitol on, on the on the first floor. So I just want to say, you know, what what an honor. Uh, a little bit of my background, and some of you know that, Miss Joanne. It's so nice to see you again. Uh, it's been, been, been a while. I was principal of Harding Academy, and her daughter, uh, Amanda, was the was, uh, same age as our daughter, and graduated uh, during those years. That was back in 1977, 8, 9, 
in the, in those years and, every, and everything. By the way, I, I'm a year older than you. I, I was born in 50. So, you were. Yeah, I was born in March of 1950. Well, my dad, I was born in Union City. My father wanted to become a minister early on, uh, and so he moved the family. He already had three kids in the 1950s and went to Lipscomb College, as it was, as a minister's school. And, you know, the same names you know, like uh, Batsel Barrett Baxter. We called him Bushel Barrel Basket. <laughs> <laughs> a lot easier to say than Batsel Barrett Baxter. Uh, so uh, all those names was up there dur during that time of, of, of those guys were there. So he became a minister, and they hired him at uh, Madison Avenue Church of Christ out of Nashville at the time. This is 1958. Uh, hired Daddy as a missionary and sent him to Naples, Florida. How many people have been to Naples, Florida? A uh, huge town now, but it was a mission town back in the 1950s and early, early 60s. Established the, the church had just been established down there, and so it was just like a utopia for a eight-year-old uh, to grow up in uh, uh, back during that time, hitting the beach every day and during the summer and things. But we gradually moved our way back up this way dur during the years. Uh, mother and daddy, their parents lived up this way in Mississippi and Tennessee. So I've been in Memphis since 1966, really. So I've been there m most of my life. I graduated from the University of Memphis, Memphis State. Uh, got a degree in education, taught at Harding Academy. That's where, where you <coughs> met Miss Myers and family. And then uh, had a couple of small businesses along the way for 20 and, 20 and 25 years. And I think it's because my father, he, he never ran for office. He wanted to, but his uh, Christian principles. And I always said, you know, we just need people in government that has Christian principles. And I remember somebody telling me at the time, don't do it, it will corrupt you. And I went, but if we don't, then only the corrupt people are there. And I'm saying, so we, you know, so I always had that desire, so I, I ran for office once in 2004 and lost, ran again in 2006 and lost. And I said, okay, I'm gonna move on and do something else. But then an opportunity came up in 2010 for the same office in the house and I ran and won. And so I've been there ever since. Been chairing the education committee for most of those because that's my passion to help uh, find ways to, to better educate our children. As a matter of fact, this year we just uh, passed a law modeled after Mississippi. Uh, I don't know if y'all know, remember, she's retired now, Commissioner Carrie Wright. She was y'all's commissioner of, of education K through 12. Y'all did this in 2014, third grade retention. Uh, if your child's not reading uh, efficiently and proficiently and, and by third grade. So we did that this year. Got a lot of pushback from it, but uh, Commissioner Wright told me, he says, don't, don't give in. Hold the course. And, and y'all are now, I remember when I was growing up, everybody always say, well, thank goodness for Mississippi because Mississippi was 50th in reading literacy and everybody else. Now Mississippi has moved up into the 40s or 30s. You're doing very, very well and continue to improve. But getting to serve uh, in the General Assembly has been a real experience for me use, using a... Uh, uh, just getting to understand how, how people how people operate and, and work. And we'll talk about this as we get into, I think Mike's got other questions, but nothing works without Jesus Christ. I am convinced of that. I've got a book here that I put out there. One of the, the biggest problems is, uh, and by the way, uh, I wrote this book, and some of you may already have it, because I did about 10 years ago, I wrote it based upon working in Panama with children. Uh, and it's called, May I Call You Dad? Uh, Why Fathers Are Needed in the Home. You know, if we could reestablish the home in, around our country, then so many children, 90, I guarantee you 95% of the ills in education today, public education could be fixed if we could restore the home. And so we, we wrote this book based upon that. It has 13 reasons why you need a father in a home. I don't know if anybody was here then. You remember uh, one time I brought a young lady from Panama by the name of Valeria Rios, or we call her Valley, uh, that she gave me the title. We brought her up here on that trip. That I brought her to Senatovia. And uh, for Valley went back home, you know, she, she had a single mother, extreme poverty, and uh, no father in the home. And before she went back home, uh, she handed me a note a little post-it note, John, and the post-it note said, I have a question. May I call you dad? And so that's where I got the title for the book, and there's a lot of stories in here about working with kids in Panama. But 
whether it be Panama, the United States, or any community, the, the bottom line is we could reestablish the home uh, for, for our children would, would, you know, fix so many things. But, and I'm so glad that I didn't run for office till later in life. I, I was elected when I was 59. And so it, it, it kind of gave me the time with experience. Not that being younger, you can do the same, but for me, I, I think I need to be older during that time. And so you realize that you can really make a difference, but you really have to know who you are. And you have to realize, I remember when I was first went up there in 2010, John, mm -hmm. I knew I was, at the age I was, I knew that if I didn't realize who I was as far as my faith, that Satan would take you and spit you out. Because they build you up. You can see it time after time after time. Everybody wants to talk to you when you're elected to something because you can do something for them, right? So everybody is in your office all the time telling you how great you are, and they want this, and they want that. So if you don't really realize what's happening, then you kind of get the big head, and then Satan will pull the rug out from under you, and then your career is, is over. And so it just, I've, fortunately... My faith has been such that, that I realize that. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Mike. I do have a question um, for both these gentlemen. Uh, since we're talking about our, our theme this year is rest for the weary and how God really has made us people who rest best in him. And I know you both come at this from the perspective of faith. And so the question is, what has racial reconciliation looked like between the both of you as your friendship has deepened over the years? Have there been certain things that you've had to work out between you or come to grips with personally yourself where you say, you know, maybe I've judged someone in a way in the past that, that I shouldn't have, and your friendship maybe has helped heal some of that? I, I think the, I think the question, what does racial reconciliation look like, that the first question is, what does racial division look like? And I think that once we look at this, reconciliation becomes a natural process. Uh, when we have suspicion, uh, when we have uh, stereotyping, distrust, mistrust, uh, when we... Uh, allow, especially we as Christians, so I approach this from the standpoint that these questions are being asked from Christians to Christians for Christians. This is not a political gathering where I have to say what is politically correct, but I can say what is biblically and spiritually correct. correct. What is biblically and spiritually correct is the Lord says, I'm no respecter of person. Of course, I know with your fine ministers and elders and teachers here that you, you know that from the Greek, the Lord is saying that I am no respecter of faces. So we know that if the Lord created us all and we're all one blood, everybody derives from Adam and Eve and Noah and his family and so on, and that the, the colors, um, the divisions, and all of those things have come over a period of time going back to the Tower of Babel when God confused the language, at some point in time we have to ask ourselves, what, why do we mistrust each other? What, what is the problem with us worshiping together? Uh, what, why is it that we feel as though uh, one, one person uh, is not worthy of, of our trust, association, of fellowship, and usually these are questions of the heart. The Bible tells us very clearly when, when the Lord sent the prophet to Jesse's house to find a replacement for King Saul, there is a, a profound statement made there that each of us have to make application to ourselves. 
Every one of us have to do an introspective examination of ourselves because all of us stand at the judgment by ourselves. God's not going to call the Coleman Avenue Church of Christ where I preach and its elders to come report and the White Station Church of Christ and its elders, the Senatopia Church of Christ and its elders. God's going to call each of us as individuals. And each man has to stand, every knee shall bow, and every mouth shall confess. What the prophet said when he had looked at all of Jesse's boys, those fine-looking boys, and says, I know this boy is the king of Israel. God said, nope, don't want him. And well, this one, this one just as pretty as the other one. He said, don't want him either. Well, look at this one. I know he'll look great riding down the streets of Jerusalem in a Cadillac tri- chariot and an Armani robe. I just know that this boy is the king. God had to get him straight. God says, look, here's the problem with you. You're impressed too fast by too little. He says man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Basically what he's saying to the prophet is you're impressed by what you see, how people talk, how they walk, what they're wearing, the color of their skin, what language they speak, where they went to school. He said you're impressed by all of that stuff. God said none of that stuff means anything to me. I made all of y'all from dirt. It means nothing to me. He says what I'm looking at is between your ears, your heart, your soul, your mind, the, who you are as a person, and what is manifested from those things. God said, that's what I'm looking at. And God's looking at every one of us, especially those of us who are Christians, because he gave us our direct orders. Our orders in a dark, ignorant world is to be light and to be salt. Now, those are direct orders. Those are divine injunctions that came directly from our king. The the church is not a democracy. We don't get to vote on what we want, and then we just do what we want uh, in a democracy. The church is a monarchy, and Jesus is the king. And Jesus gave us our orders. He told us to be light. And if the world is in ignorance and darkness and division and Excuse the expression, the stupidity that we have seen on both sides, both among blacks and whites, all political parties, all socioeconomic levels, when we have found what's comfortable for us and not what's pleasing to God, uh, we have to take some time and ask ourselves if we are following the Lord's orders. So reconciliation Reconciliation is nothing more than obedience. Folks who claim, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Oh, how I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. This I... The Lord equates love with obedience. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's real simple. It's fundamental. If you love me, keep my commandments. He says, a new command. Now that I've told you, here's the criterion of showing me you love me. That's keeping my commandments. Now that you got that, here is a new command I give you. He says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples and that you what? That you love one another. Now, folks say, wait a minute. Now, that's, how can that be new? Moses told folks to love each other. Joshua told folks to love each other. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, John, uh, the psalmist. Jesus says, nope, you let me finish. Let me finish. You love one another as I love you. There's a new standard. You don't just love those that love you. You don't just love those that look like you. You don't just love those that talk like you, dress like you, went to the same school, same fraternity, same sorority, same uh, 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 political party. You love everybody in the same way I loved you. I loved you when you weren't even lovable. I loved you when you didn't love me back. So what the Lord is saying is the church is the light of the world. We're the folks who are supposed to get together and say, this is the way it's supposed to be done. We separate the holy from the profane. So how do we have reconciliation? We're just obedient. We love our brother. The Paul, I think the apostle Paul said one time, uh, basically, we put up with one another. You know, my daddy used to say, so you blame him for this statement. 
My dad used to say, I'm crazy, you crazy, all God's children crazy. So in saying so, he's saying, you put up with me, I'll put up with you. You forgive me, I'll forgive you. You talk to me, I'll talk to you. And what we find out when we get through sitting down, stop fussing, move all the silly stuff, all the blinders, all the blockers, all the stumbling blocks, and we just talk to each other and look in the eye, we say, hey, I kind of like this guy. Oh, yeah, I kind of like this guy, too. That's what we found out in 1968 at Alamo High School. Because everybody, we sit down, we play football together, we play basketball together, uh, and, and, and it didn't take long for us to realize we're just, we're just a bunch of kids. That, it's just that simple. There are folks who make their living making us act stupid. And at some point in time, we got to make them go broke. Because that's the way they make their living. And that is putting a wedge between us. And at some point, we just have to say, we've had enough. If we're going to have a country with freedom for all these fine-looking children to have, then our generation has got to mend some fences, build some bridges, beg each other's pardon, pray together, worship together, love each other, and they can have the same thing God gave us. Yeah, I broke my own rule. I, you never speak after John. <laughs> you see what I mean by the period? <laughs> right, and, and everything you just said to build up on that is – it, and it's all based upon your faith. The reconciliation, like I say, we do it, we, we obey the commandments. We obey what Christ said. I was just, I had made a couple of notes this morning when I was thinking about this in, in Matthew 22 where Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and mind. Okay, that's a command. But then he said, and the second most important thing is we love each other as we love ourselves. Okay, that's beautifully said. How do you do it? There's only one way. There's only one way because the world will, like I say, will, will eat us apart. It, I'm, I'm, in politics, I'm always frustrated that we're, we're continually told, told that we're different, and we're not. We're, we're brothers and sisters, and, and we all have the, the same uh, needs and wants and, and desires. So what I have been doing for, for a while now is – is realizing that, okay, how do you find, how do you get to that point in your life where you really can understand and do those things? And so per, in my life, I've been told all my life, you know, you got to spend time alone with God. you got to pray, you got to read the scriptures, and you got to medit meditate on him. And you have just got to find time to do that if you're not doing that. I remember growing up with it being the preacher's son, you know, I was in church every Sunday and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And, of course, you wrote a me, read a million scriptures on there. But one day about 15 years ago, I was sitting down going, you know what, what, what if the first thing God asked me in heaven is, did you read my book? And I'm going, well, I wrote, wrote a verse here and a verse there, but did I, did I read your book? How am I going to answer that? So I... I spent a year reading from Genesis to Revelations, just so I could say I read your book, you know. But as I got into that, then I started to understand the, beautiful, the beauty of the Old Testament. And then when Christ came along, how he filled, fulfilled all, all those things. So I guess where I'm going with to answer your question, Mike, is, is that you, the only way you can is you've got to have a personal relationship with your Creator. So he tells us to love each other. How do we do that? And then when you look into the book of Philippians where he's talking about that he wants us to grow in knowledge and understanding. And these aren't just words. Think about it. He wants us to grow in knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And what is wisdom? You know, so you begin to develop that relationship and he's doing and then I was reading, if you, if, how many of you have, do you have the devotional book called, uh, what's it called, Circle, Draw the Circle, anybody familiar with that? It's a 40-day study where you 40 days and there's a devotion on each one. And I got this from, from uh, that particular book. 
Think about this. And it's so easy to read over this stuff if you don't spend time with it. Acts 10, verse 2. It says, Cornelius prayed constantly. You remember Cornelius? Who was he? He was the Roman, gen- Roman uh, captain or general. And he said he prayed all the time. Well, I've read that a million times, and you just go right on past it. But think about what C- Cornelius prayed constantly. And because of his prayer, he was a Gentile. At that time, Peter, you know, the the word was just for the Jewish faith at that time. So he prayed constantly. God sent a vision to Cornelius and says, send your men over to uh, Joppa where Peter is. Peter had a vision where the sheet came down. And then Peter went over to to, uh, where Cornelius was. And they had a couple days of of conversation. Think about this. Guys, that's our genealogy. The Gentiles became Christians because of Cornelius' prayer and and God using him in that vision where Peter came over and said, it's okay to you to preach to others and this Jews. That's where we come from. That's our genealogy right there. And I, I read over that a million times. It's because Cornelius prayed constantly. Do we do that? And when we do, things change. I am convinced that the only way to change the world, and it's always been like that, y'all know this, the only way to change this world we're living in with the dysfunction is to pray constantly. Because God has the answers. And he knows how we need to act and how we need to do. But it's not going to happen with us just getting out there and getting up every day and going out about our business. As Christians, we have to, we have to um, realize that and develop such a prayer life and a meditation life that things begin to change. Could I, could I make an addendum to what Mark just said and what I said earlier? I remember when integration first started, we, we consider... We consider reconciliation in uh, forcing, forcing things and forcing people together. And the, uh, uh, I don't think that there's, was, and, and, and I know I'm in a different state than the state of Tennessee, so I hope that I'm not uh, insulting anybody by saying what I'm getting ready to say. But I think one of the biggest mistakes that were made during the time of integration was forced busing. Uh, because, you know, people of like faith, of like concerns, of like beliefs, of like culture, of like desires, of like ambition, are going to, going to naturally gravitate toward one another the way we do now. The way things happen now are the way they should have happened in the 60s. Move the law, change the law, move stuff out of the way, move the roadblocks, Get all the ridiculous laws off the book and let people do what people do. And had we done that, I think that we wouldn't have a lot of the racial animosity we have today because we ruin schools, we ruin neighborhoods, uh, a lot of, of the camaraderie that made the na- folks proud of their neighborhoods. Now those neighborhoods are ghettos and uh, run down uh, like some of, the, some of those in Memphis. Basically, you can't make a person do anything. You teach them, you, you give them the scriptures, you give them the word of God, you show them what is best, you teach by precept and example, then you step out of the way and let people do what people do. And I, I think that if we're going to have reconciliation, then we have to change our minds, that's all. I change my mind about you, you change your mind about me, and all of a sudden, we're talking, we have dialogue, we find out we've got stuff in common, we want the same thing for our children, we have the same faith, we want to go to heaven, and all of, and, and all of a sudden, the stuff that used to divide us is unimportant. Uh, I think God made us a whole lot better than we give ourselves credit. We don't need the law, the Congress, and others to beat us across the head to make us act like God's children. All we got to start doing is just listening to God.
much now because I really like that. I want that to be the last thing. Um, I'm going to grab your mic. Um, you can tell that tonight is is just being together and sharing these things together as a as a family of God is is rich. This is good. Um, there's a scripture I wanted to read tonight from Zephaniah 3. It goes like this. Then I will give the, the people of all nations pure speech so that all of them will speak the name of the Lord and worship me together. Now this is a dual fulfilling prophecy. What that means is it, it actually is going to be fulfilled twice. Number one, in Christ. And the number two, uh, together in heaven. Um, so I, I wanted to read that because it talks about all the nations worshiping together. Um, some of the healthiest churches that I've ever been to or been a part of uh, have been have been fully integrated, and and it was it was a blessing to be able to to share. Uh, when I went to Harding University, uh, one of the greatest blessings is sitting in chapel and. Uh, even though they, they make, make you go to chapel. One of the ideas is that we're at least all together, and we all we don't have to use a book when we sing 728B. You know what I'm talking about. We just all are, are there together and worshiping as one. And I have to think that that's uh, a moment that God smiles with. Uh, but before we're finished here tonight, what I'm going to do is I will have this mic, and I'm going to let these two gentlemen share the mic that John has right now. Uh, but we're going to let you a- ask some questions. And it, it seems like we need to take another hour with this. But uh, we're going to go ahead and just open it up. And if you do have a question, I'm going to have to give you the mic because we do have people online that need to hear the question as well too. So is there anyone that has any question you can refer to, either John or Mark, or just leave it open to each, uh, whoever wants to respond to that. But does anyone have any questions tonight about uh, reconciliation, about race? Um, or, or anything that these gentlemen have already talked about that you want to know just a little bit more of. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so I'm 50, and I don't have the perspective that you two gentlemen have being a little bit older than I am. Um, in the world we live in now, uh, you know, you hear a lot that race relations are better than they've ever been, and some people say they're worse than they've ever been. Um, from your perspective, okay, what are your thoughts on that? Are they, are, are going back, we'll say 50, 60 years, okay, are race relations, in your opinion, better than they were 50, 60 years ago, or are they worse? Because I think there are some people in this world, like you talked about, uh, that want to drive a wedge in between people and, and say that they're worse. Um, so what are y'all's perspectives on that? Now that you wrap up on this one. Good, good question. Um, I think the real issue is, is that as we as a country move further away from moral values, then there's a lot of division amongst a lot of groups of people and not just based upon on race. And so, you know, the, the most contention we have up in the legislature now is holding on to values that we want to protect our children in, say, in school. You know, all the issues around that. So there's a lot of disagreement, a lot of division on that. And naturally, if you, if you have division with lack of moral values, then that's going to affect other things like race, race, race marriages, uh, family values, children with their parents. So I think it's more of that than, than maybe the other. John may have a little bit different uh, perspective. But I think it's, it's due to we, we, we as a, a nation, when fewer people are brought up with Christian values or moral values, then that creates division. I, I, th- I think that Mike hit it, I mean, Mark hit it right on the head as far as uh, the connection with moral values, our spirituality, and what God teaches. I think you're exactly right. Because when you look at the question, is uh, are, are race relations better today than they have ever been or worse today than they have ever been? I think that race relations today are, are, are real. 
And when I say that, I mean, you know, we're not forced by the law. Uh, you, you don't have colored and white water fountains. You don't have colored and white schools. You don't have uh, all of those trappings around segregation that the law upheld. The law forced that, seg that segregation. It wasn't because all people wanted it. It wouldn't have changed. Black people and white people stood with Dr. King and others. I was there in Memphis, Tennessee, when they marched there in Memphis. Uh, there were black people, white people, men, women, Jews, Gentiles, folks of all socioeconomic levels who got together and said, this is not the America that we want. This is not what the Constitution says. This is not what we want to project to the rest of the world. So they joined arms uh, in that eclectic group of people. They marched down the streets of Memphis and other streets around the city in Mississippi and Alabama and Tennessee and all over this country, and they changed the world. They changed the world in a nonviolent fashion, singing We Shall Overcome. I was there when Dr. King made his last speech. Uh, it was a time of racial tension. It was so thick, it was like you could cut it. The man had been threatened. He knew uh, that the threats were real this time. <clears throat> he had heard that he was not going to leave Memphis. I remember sitting there. Uh, it was a rainy night, and and watching his voice tremble and him not seem like himself. I asked my father what was wrong, and he told me uh, that he had been threatened. The relevance of all of this is this was a time when America <clears throat> needed to change, and we did. We did change. We elected a black president two terms. I had some uh, black folks. Uh, I don't often use the term African-American, but we have some black folks who said to me, well, you know, uh, we elected this president. I said, now, what is it about the term minority that you don't get? Said, if you say that we are a minority, <clears throat> and we hear that all the time, I said, obviously, you didn't elect this president by yourself. Obviously, a whole lot of white people and Hispanic people, a lot of men, a lot of women, a lot of folks who were independent, folks who were in the middle, folks who wanted to do right, folks who wanted to send the right perspective. Whether or not you like the guy, hate the guy, appreciate policies or don't, America demonstrated in two terms and two elections that we're not the same country we used to be. At some point, we got to face that. We got to bury the past you know, you can't unwrite history. You can't rewrite history. Only thing we can do is learn from history so we can write a better future for our children. And it is not until we're able to bury <clears throat> those things, thank you, those things that are past so that we can look to those things that are in the future that we're really going to understand race relations. Why, why are we here today? I'm a black guy sitting in a church, and I see two or three black people uh, in, in the building tonight. I don't see any animosity. I don't see anybody feeling uncomfortable. I don't see anyone feeling unwelcome. Um, and if y'all came to my church Sunday morning at Coleman Avenue, you'd have a wonderful time too. One of the things we got to stop doing, stop counting heads. Stop acting as though it's some type of homogenous process to where we got to send a report to God on how well we are integrating. Just stop the foolishness. If, if folks walk in that door, red, white, black, pink, polka dot, pant stripe, whatever they are, make them feel welcome that they're children of God. And if we sit down together and worship together, all of this stuff disappears over a period of time. We realize we've changed and we didn't, it didn't take a whole lot of effort. It didn't take a whole lot of effort. And we realized that we have changed. And I believe we have changed. Do we have problems? Absolutely. Yes, we've got problems because we got folks who are the purveyors and the marketers of division, hatred. Race has been weaponized in our country and is being used to divide us. Khrushchev said in 1963, we're going to take your country. He said, we're going to take your country, and we're going to take it without firing a shot. How is he going to do that? He said, I'm going to 
make black folks hate white folks. White folks hate black folks. Rich folks hate poor folks. Poor folks hate uh, rich folks. The educated hate the illiterate. In other words, I'm going to divide you so much. We're going to divide you so much on the inside that we're going to take your country without firing a shot. Has race been weaponized? Absolutely. Do we still have a lot to do? Yes, we do. But it's going to take each of us as individuals acting like we got some common sense with a common goal for the common defense and for the good of these children. Again, I want that to be the, <laughs> the last phrase because that's so good. You just, that's, that's good. Um, anyone else have a question tonight? I can't. And, and these folks know that's a big deal. <laughs> anyone else tonight have a question? Go and just raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. Can I say something to our young people? Yes. One thing. I've been discovering also for for young people. Got, we have a few in here. Is as you begin to as you grow and you try to figure out what you want to do and you worry about that. Oh, look, I don't know what I'm going to become and all things. Remember this. This is something that I've been thinking a lot about lately because I spent a lot of time thinking about children and education things. Is Psalms 139. You know what it says? It says, "And God created you in the dark of your mother's womb." and laid out every single day of your life before a single day had passed. He has such a plan for you already. Now, if you go down his way, he will show you amazing things. If you go down your way and try to do what you want to do or rebel, then you miss out on all those opportunities. So just think about that. Let him, but you got to stay close to him, let him tell you what he has planned for your life. Wish I'd thought of that 40, 50 years ago or realized that. We, would, we probably wouldn't make a lot of mistakes we made and everything. So just keep that in mind. I would like, could I? Yes. You mind if I put an addendum to that? It, 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 you know, when um, I think God has a plan for, as Mark said, for these young folks' lives. The young, these, these kids, I'm looking at these young men here, these fine young men and young ladies in this room. The census says that they are about 25% of the population. But they're 100% of the future. If America's going to have a future, they're it. They're it. And we got to understand that they're sitting in classrooms in many cities right now, including Memphis and other major cities around this country, and they're being taught to hate each other as they sit in the classroom. When you think about these various theories that are being taught in the guise of history, uh, it, it's not history at all. It's, it's propaganda, it's indoctrination, and it's changing the mind of our young folks and teaching them to hate each other. When you talk about, if I, if I go back and talk about slavery as anything other than history, this was a phase in American history. If I bring it over into 2023 and the residuals of slavery and all of this and all of this other foolishness, I've got to jump across a two-term black president, black governors, black senators, black congressmen, black billionaires, millionaires, sports stars, movie stars, homeowners. I got to jump across a whole lot of positive stuff to get back to the plantation. And when you start at the plantation and you're teaching kids like this that Oh, the reason you can't succeed is because that white kid sitting beside you or that black kid sitting beside you, uh, uh, they're, the, they're the problem. Understand something. We're teaching these children to hate the country, to hate the Lord, to hate the church, to hate their parents. They don't have to say the Pledge of Allegiance. They don't have to pray. We're, we're teaching them uh, uh, to be totally separate from all the things that made us a great country in 200 years. Oh, we've made some doozies of mistakes in 200 years. We got our faults, failures, and flaws, but we also have always corrected ourselves by our faith. It is our faith that has brought us back. You got countries that got buildings 1,500 years old that are still cutting women's heads off in the marketplace. And we're still talking about stuff we fixed 100 years ago. What we've got to do is just continue to move forward. 
we, we've got issues. We've got problems. We do. But every problem can simply be solved, as Mark said. We've got to go back and find our moral compass. And when we do, we'll be just, let me, and if, if, let me say this also. I am insulted by what we hear today being called civil rights. Um, it's a guise and a smoke string for the LGBTQRST folks and the folks who want to continue genocide. We've killed 63 million babies since 1973 under the name of abortion. So civil rights is not, nobody's going in the back door and drinking out of colored water fountains, but they'll use civil rights as a smoke screen to cover up for what the real issues are in America. And the real issue is abortion and the destruction of the institution of marriage. And you as parents and Christians are subversives. You're insurrectionists. You're violent. You're vile. You're evil. You're destructive because you believe in the Bible. We better get a clue and realize it's really not about race anymore. It's about the survival of this nation. I know we can go uh, much longer tonight, and I think some of you probably wouldn't mind. But what we're going to do is we're going to close it out this evening. And if you do have any specific personal questions that you want to ask these gentlemen, I think they're going to hang around a little bit here tonight. And I don't think they would have any trouble answering certain questions that you might have. Um, again, thank you for being here this evening. We do have some prayer requests we'd like to mention before we're finished here. Uh, I was with uh, Rita Whalen when she had her surgery this morning. Her and, and Paula, uh, she was there, and I spent some time talking with her. Uh, she had uh, throat surgery this morning and came through it just fine. Uh, she was pretty much out of it when she came back to the room, but shes I believe she's going to be fine. Uh, services for Margaret Presley's sister, Mary Reeser, will be June 23rd at Memorial Park on Poplar. Uh, I believe that's in Memphis. Visitation. 12 to 1 p.m., and the service is to follow at 1 o'clock. We also extend our love and sympathy to Anna and James Sims and family in the death of James' mother, Kathy. Her funeral will be here in our building next Tuesday, June 27th at 6 p.m. We will feed this family at 4.30 that afternoon on that Tuesday before the memorial service. Please get your dish to the activities building, kitchen, in a throwaway pan, by 3.30 at the latest, please, on that day. Um, and then Megan Boyles will be setting up her directory pictures uh, uh, sat Sunday the 25th. And that is this coming Sunday, is that correct? Uh, Studio-style portraits are 11 to 1 in the classroom in the foyer, and outdoor sessions are 7 to 8 p.m. in, in cold water. So for those who want to take advantage of, of each one of those, those, those are the times. And then on the bottom here, and I wanted to make sure to clarify this, it says Mike Jones is seeing a cardiologist in the morning. Um, I don't know if Mike is, is with us this evening. Uh, okay, so we want to pray for him. Uh, all right. Uh, again, thank you for being here tonight. And I, I again, thank you, gentlemen, for coming down here from Memphis. Uh, uh, I believe you all came from Nashville today. Was that not right? You were in Nashville, drove to Memphis, and then here to be here tonight. And uh, we appreciate that so much. Um, these gentlemen um, are a testimony to what God is doing. And may he use all of us, all of us, to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Let's bow as we pray for these tonight. Father in heaven, tonight again has been a wonderful gift to be here, to be together, to share in uh, subjects that are difficult, uh, I think, for 
even for, for many of us that, again, want to be part of the solution. There, there's still uh, unresolved issues in our own heart when we look in our mirror and we see uh, the fact that we have judged people in many ways too quickly, in ways that are unfair, in ways that we need to apologize to you and we need to uh, seek for ways, Father, to to establish relationships that honor Jesus Christ. And it does not matter the color of our skin. Matter of fact, we should love and accept and reach out. Because, Father, when we think about what Jesus has done for us, <laughs> uh, the grace, oh, the mercy, all of that, it, it wouldn't make any sense that Jesus would, would look at each one of us and say, okay, what is the color of your skin first? before deciding if we were candidates for his blood. I pray that you would help us to open up our hearts because that's why Jesus died, to open them up to each other and to you primarily. Father, we pray right now for Rita Whalen as she uh, recovers from her surgery, uh, as she's probably home by now. I pray for uh, the... Presley family as they mourn the loss of Mary, and then for the Sims family and the loss of Kathy. And I pray that you would comfort them, that you would carry them through this time. And Father, we, we also want to pray for Mike, uh, seeing the cardiologist, and I pray that whatever needs to happen on his behalf, that you would solve that even before he, he gets checked out. I understand fully of being <laughs> going through testing and and, and people lately telling me that, uh, that that things have worked out well. I understand that, and I pray that you bless our brother and so many more as they deal with some of these issues of the flesh. Lord, I pray that you bless us the rest of this evening as we share together here, but then also as we choose to make a difference in the lives of others the same way that you chose to make a difference in our lives. We want to be more and more like you, Jesus. So help us to do what we've been shared with tonight, to speak the truth in love. Through Jesus we pray. And the church said, amen. Thank you all very much. These gentlemen will be available up here. <laughs>